said, every time I try and get out, they say, they pull me back in. Remember that line? It's the same thing. Isn't that, isn't that true in the world? Isn't that true of the devil? Every time, you, every time you try and get out, he wants to pull you back in. But it's the strong and courageous person that despite the fact that they're trying to pull you in, they keep moving forward. They keep walking toward Christ. No matter how many hands got your arm and your legs and your shoulders and trying to pull you back, you should shrug them off and keep walking forward. Keep walking forward. Keep walking forward. Why? Because you have made a commitment. You have decided. Good morning. We want to welcome you to our Sunday morning broadcast. Pastors David and Donna Spearman welcome you. Welcome to Kingdom First, located here in Fort Wayne. As we say, God loves Fort Wayne. Please feel free to share today's broadcast with as many people as you know. Also, feel free to comment if you get encouraged, blessed, or stirred up as you hear the Word of God. And use the emojis at any time to get our online activity to be heard throughout our time. If you're watching YouTube Live, display us on your smart TV for your entire family to watch. But now, let's get into this power-packed message. To be able to come here and lift our hands, to open up our mouths, to be able to praise Him. Amazing, amazing, supernatural, 
Through it all, through it all, my eyes are 
bless each and every single one of you. For those who are watching by streaming live, God bless you. Thanks for being with us this morning. It is a pleasure to have you watching, and you could be doing something else, but you chose to be here and you chose to watch, so we thank you for that. Uh, we are going to go right into our lesson this morning. Now, a couple of weeks ago, well, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Caleb, then we talked about Ruth. Now, today, we're going to go over into Mark chapter 1, verse 40, and uh, we're going to have a lesson on what, uh, about cleansing the leper. And uh, I can already tell you, next week we're going to talk about the paralytics. I, I already got that one in the hopper. So, but today we're going to talk about cleansing the lepers. So let's read Mark chapter 1, verse 40 through 44. The Bible says, And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion. Somebody's talking? Okay. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Let me first start out now. Uh, normally, I would kind of try and give you a backstory as to what this one, who, who this guy was, or who this person was. There is no backstory on this person. He is simply a leper. And really, that's all you need to know. But that's really all he was, was a leper. Now, leprosy in ancient times, as well as even today's times, is quite an insidious disease. Uh, here again, the Bible doesn't tell us any more about this guy, uh, no more than just he is a leper. And in all honesty, um, that was his life at this point. That was enough information because despite who he was, despite where he came from, despite his, his uh, uh, background, what, what tribe he was from, despite any of those things, his leprosy overshadowed everything else about him. Because it doesn't matter, all that other stuff didn't matter, he had leprosy and he was outcast from society. He was only known as a leper. Now, until recently, there was no cure, and when I say recently, up until about 1845 or 1850 or something like that, there was no cure for leprosy. It's a disease that affects the nervous system of a person to where they don't feel pain. Leprosy is infectious disease. that causes severe disfigurement and skin sores nerve damage around the arms, legs, and skin area, or just basically all over your body. So the leper had this awful disease in all of its horrors. And when you see something like that, as you can see on the screen, it's, it's pretty horrible. Throughout scripture, now throughout scripture, understand this, leprosy is a type or picture of sin. That's what leprosy is considered, it's like a type or picture of sin. So what leprosy does to the body, sin does to the soul. Just like the most dominant factor in the leper's life was his leprosy, the most prominent factor in the life of humanity is that we are all sinners. So we can see the effects of leprosy, and trust me and believe me in this, you can see the effects of sin. It obliterates, sin obliterates all other facts about you. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, none of that stuff matters. Your success, money, your prestige, Everything about you is totally obliterated by the fact that sin reigns in humanity's mortal bodies. It overshadows our lives. Leprosy is the perfect example of what sin does. It spreads, it grows, it makes you numb, and then leads to death. I'll say that again. It spreads, sin spreads. It grows like leprosy grows, sin grows. It makes you numb. How often have we become numb to the things of this world that are just are tragic, all right? And ultimately it, ultimately, it leads to death. Our society, our culture, and the society that we live in today, not only just here in America, but worldwide in reality, has become very tolerant of sin. We've become numb to it. You know, I, I, I can recall 30, 40 years ago things that, our culture would say, whoa, what are you doing? Today we celebrate. 
things that our culture would say, man, you know, that, no, we don't do it. We celebrate. How many, how many times have we seen uh, the, the media and others come to the champions, you know, become champions of things that the Bible says are, are perverted or wrong or, or, you know, shouldn't be done? God calls things abominations, and yet we celebrate them. Amen? And we, even in the church, have become numb to those things. Oh, well, that's them. We've become so numb that we just, in a sense, look the other way. It's no wonder that we aren't really going out and telling people about Jesus. Because we have looked at the things of this world and they've become normal in our sight. Didn't get an amen on that one, Alvesto. <laughs> Even in our colleges, we send our kids to college because we want them to have a college education, right? We want them to go to a, a college so that they can learn more about what's going on in the world. We want them to go there because they'll get new ideas and fresh, you know, uh, uh, different points of view and so forth and so on. Well, no longer on a college campus is that true. On the college campus now, it's all about indoctrination. Even in our high schools and junior high schools, all the way down to elementary school, it's about indoctrination, indoctrinating them in certain in, in, in lifestyles and cultures and things that you don't practice in your home or you ought not practice in your home. And yet these, be, these have become indoctrination stations, places, and, and uh, the government says, you've got to send your kid here. You've got to do this. We're going to do this regardless of what you think or what you say. Over your objections, we're going to indoctrinate them in these things because they need to know. Well, back in the 60s when I was in uh, elementary school, have I dated myself? <laughs> when I was in elementary school in junior high, I was in junior high and elementary all through the 60s, even part of high school in the 60s. When I was there, you know, we didn't, I never took a sex education class. Never, the, 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 never took a sex education class. Now, I learned about it at home with my mom and dad, but never took a, never took a class in sex education in school. Now, here's the funny thing. I went to a high school that had 5,000 students in the city of Detroit, 5,000 students. Out of those 5,000 students, the entire time I was in high school, only one girl got pregnant. One. Somebody ought to be saying amen to that. <laughs> but, but yet, wait a minute, yet our culture say, tells us that oh, oh, parents aren't doing their job. They're not telling their kids about sex. They're not telling their children the things that they need to avoid. So we're going to do it for you. And the way they do it, of course, they do it without talking about Jesus. They do it without talking about the fact that God says, uh, you know, tells us what adultery is and fornication and so forth. So they do it without all those things. So now we're teaching kids from kindergarten, first, second, third grade, all about, you know, sex and so forth and so on. And I don't think that's really age appropriate, and be, to be honest with you. I just don't think it's age appropriate. So now you're kindling a fire and someone who is vulnerable, who doesn't know how to, how, how to, how to separate the wheat from the straw, <laughs> who doesn't know how to separate the wheat from the chaff, amen, who doesn't know how to make that separation, you're, you're, you're putting in them something, they're extremely vulnerable, you're putting something in them, and so now you're setting them up for failure. You're setting them up for failure. And, but yet our culture and our media champions those kind of causes and said that's the right thing to do. This is how we ought to, this, we got to teach our children. If we don't teach our children, then how, are they, how else are they going to learn? How about at home? How about here in the church house? Huh? How about here? How about at home? How about the people who love them and care for them, instruct them and walk them through this thing at an age-appropriate time? Every kid at five and six and seven doesn't need to know. Maybe some might not need to know, but guess what? Most don't need to know at that age. I would dare say, in my opinion, none need to know at that age. And there comes a point in their life when they need to begin to understand those things and at home, mom and dad, or if it's just the mom or if it's just the dad, trust me, they're equipped. I do not underestimate the wisdom and knowledge of a parent. 
Even a young parent, hey, when you go through changing diapers and having to feed a baby and go through all those, those things, you gain a little something. Now some, eh. <laughs> but for the most part, those are things that should be done at home. And I'm not, I'm not trying to dump on anybody. I'm just trying to help you understand what we, what's happening in our culture. They champion causes. Right now, biggest ch the cause they're championing is, is, is transsexuals, calling men women. Come on now. Nobody's stupid. It's a man. Sin leaves a mark. Just like leprosy leaves a mark, sin leaves a mark. It leaves a mark on your continence. The mouth becomes hard, shows bitterness. Over a period of time. There was, Abraham Lincoln had a, a, a man that he was going to, or the, somebody wanted him to put in his cabinet. And Abraham Lincoln said, I don't like his face. He said, well, what, the guy's a nice guy, good guy. He says, I don't like his face. And he went on to tell this person, he said, look, when, you're, when you get past 40, he said, your life is etched on your face. He said, your life is etched on his face. He said, and I don't like his face. I don't like what sin has left on his face. And, that is, and that's absolutely true. You know, there's some people you look at, I'm 68, all right? And... <laughs> <laughs> then I hear somebody say, wow. <laughs> no, and, and you well, just turned 68, had a birthday on the 17th, you guys know that. And, and you know, my face is pretty clear. I, I don't have a bunch of lines, and, and, and I'm not sagging in a whole lot of places. I mean, I'm sagging maybe in a few, but not too many. Not too many. I, I'm, st I'm, hey, hey, I, I'm still a, a, you know, a lean, mean fight machine. <laughs> you know, I can still, I can still, you know, throw them if I got to now. Come on, you know. <laughs> you know, come down to it, I can hurt somebody. <laughs> I, I still got it. I got a little footwork too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can still do the Ali shuffle. So I'm just letting you, you know, now, you know, but so, I've seen some people. Boy, I mean, they're they not even 60. they 58. Man, they had led a hard life. Sin has etched their body, etched their face. And I firmly believe that. I believe sin will put a mark on your countenance. It's just, it doesn't just ravage your soul, but it will mark your body. Your, your eye, the eyes begin to reveal anger and hate. You ever look at somebody and look in their eyes and you can see the hate and the anger in their eyes? See, that's a product of sin. Come on now. So sin not only ravages you spiritually and ravages your soul, but it shows itself in your body just like the lepers. Sin kills. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hebrews 9, 27 says, and, and as much as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. Sin kills. Every man is going to die because of sin. But will it etch itself in your body? Will it, will, it, will, it, will it disfigure you spiritually? Or can you get away from, uh, away from underneath that curse of sin and death and live a life that's holy unto God? So we find that Jesus is in town, as the scripture says over in Mark chapter 1, verse 40. Jesus is in town. The leper had heard of him, and even, the leper, uh, even in the leper colony, he heard about Jesus. He heard about his healing these hopeless cases. Now remember, 
Leprosy was not something that could be cured. It wasn't something that could be cured. It, it, you got leprosy, it was a death sentence. That was it. As you saw in the pictures, people's hands were, were down to nubs, feet, toes, go, you know, toes gone, even feet gone, sores, and, and, and all just, it's all kind of things going on. So it's not a wonder, it's, it's no wonder that a leper was not allowed in regular society because if he was, then everybody else would be infected. So you had, they had to live outside the city. They lived in what we call leper colonies. Uh, I didn't know this, but when I did a little research on this, I found out in Hawaii. Hawaii. I always wanted to go to Hawaii, but I don't think I want to go now. That in, in Hawaii, that, uh, uh, you know, there is uh, you, leprosy. I was like, gee. But he heard about Jesus, and he heard about Jesus healing these hopeless cases. And his case was definitely hopeless. There was nothing anybody could do. Could Jesus heal him? Could Jesus deliver him, cleanse him? He knew that he could because of what he heard that Jesus had done for others. Not necessarily other lepers, but other people. But the question that he had in his heart and his mind, and I think it's a question many of us have, would he heal him? I've heard many of people say, at as, as different times and different places I've preached and having different healing lines, I've heard many people say, well, will he heal me? But the Bible tells us that he will. The Bible says, by his stripes. Now remember, before Jesus went on the cross, they had whipped him 40 stripes minus one, or 40 with, you know, hits with the lash minus one. And he was hit with a cat of nine tails. The Romans had a cat of nine tails. There was leather uh, uh, strings, or leather, uh, um, yeah, strings, I guess you could say. And in the, intertwined in that leather, in each one of those was bits of sharpened bone and metal. So when they hit you with the lash, pow, they would drag it across your body. And what it was intended to do was not only hit you and hurt you, but also rip your back apart. Now imagine taking 39 of those type of lashes. 39. I'm telling you, I, I, I was talking about how the lean, mean fight machine, but one of those will probably take me out. <laughs> I, I, you know, honestly, I don't know how people live through those kind of things. I don't know how people dealt with that kind of stuff. I just don't understand it. It's, 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 it's beyond my, my ability to understand how people can be lashed, you know, 30, 40 times and live. You know, the skin on your back and your buttocks and, the, and your thighs is ripped open. You're bleeding profusely. And Jesus took 39 of those. And the Bible tells us that that was for our healing. That was for our healing. So that each one of those lashes, each one obliterated multiple diseases. So any and every disease that has been known to mankind that has ever come up or will come up, including, uh, um, what is it, what, we, what we're going through now? Was it... Um, COVID, thank you, including COVID, was on his back. Those lashes even healed COVID. Those lashes healed cancer. Those lashes healed any and every disease, including leprosy. Every single one. It doesn't matter what it is. Pneumonia, it doesn't matter. Diabetes, doesn't matter. Epilepsy, it doesn't matter. You name it, he took it upon his back. By his stripes, you were healed. That's a cue for somebody to call out their healing right now. They declare, I'm healed because the stripes of Jesus healed me 2,000 years ago. His back and his legs were ripped apart so that I can be healed, so that I can be free. So these things cannot come upon me and stay upon me and ravage my body and destroy my soul. So he didn't doubt that Jesus could heal him. He'd heard too many testimonies. 
He didn't see him because he was in the leper colony, mind you. But he heard about it. And he heard about this great healer, this young prophet who came along and, and was healing any and everybody that, that, that came his way. I want to share something else with you that you might not have recognized or realized. Jesus never went to anybody to heal them. They came to him. Now, why was that? Because, see, they had to come by faith. See, it's all about faith. And they had to come by faith. See, you know, if you're waiting on the healer to come to you, you can forget it. But if you get up like this leper and you go to him, now you'll get something. Amen? So he had the assurance that Jesus could heal. He heard so many testimonies. Listen, there's so many books written. There's so many testimonies by people about how they were healed, how they were, their bodies were ravaged. My own mother had tuberculosis. They wanted to take out part of her lung, and yet she called upon the name of the Lord, and he healed her, and she did not have to go and have the surgery. She told the doctor, I'm healed. He says, how do you know? She said, because as I laid in my bed, and I crossed my arms over my chest, and I called on the name of the Lord that God touched me with his hand he touched me and I've been healed and let me tell you something that was oh maybe 60 some odd years in fact it was about 65 years ago my mother is still alive listen up until recently she never even had, she never even had a doctor she had not and has not been sick Finally, in her middle 80s, she suffered a, a little something, but it wasn't nothing. It was just a, a, a little problem inside her body. They took care of that, and she's, she's still going. She's still moving. Listen, over 60 some odd years, God has sustained her. I believe with all my heart that when you are touched by God, that touch will sustain you the rest of your life. When Jesus reaches his hand out of heaven and touches your body, he will do something to you. He will change you, man. I'm telling you, all it takes is one touch from God. And you'll never be the same. Since that day, she's had no disease. None. She'll be 88 in April. No disease. I know she's going to live a long life. Why? Because she's been touched by God. She's been touched by God. You know what I'm real thankful for? The fact that when she prayed and asked the Lord to heal her, she asked the Lord to take care of me. <laughs> she said, I prayed for you. She said, I have my little boy. She said, I told the Lord, I got to get home with my little boy. You take care of him, Lord, all the days of his life, and he's been taking care of me. So I can tell you, I'm 68 years old, but I got another 60 years to go. Because <laughs> the hand of the Lord is on me. How do I know that? Because Brother Barnes, when I was eight, nine years old in our church, Brother Barnes used to come up to me and say, David, the hand of the Lord is on you. I didn't understand what he meant at that time, but see, today I finally understand what he means. The hand of the Lord is on you. Not only to preach the gospel, not only to declare his glorious works, but he's going to sustain me. He has sustained me and will continue to sustain me. Not only just me, my wife, my son, my daughter, my grandchildren, my son-in-law. He's going Because when God touches you, it moves down from this generation to the next, to the next, down to the third and fourth generation. God's touch, man, is awesome. It's mighty. I'm not looking for God to do a whole lot. I'm just looking for him to touch me one time. Because I know that one touch from God will take me everywhere I need to go. That one touch from God will help me, will set me up straight, amen, will keep me in my right mind, glory to God, will keep my heart going, will keep my mind going, will keep everything going so I can live to the glory of Almighty God, declare his works, glory. Oh, somebody ought to shout now. And so here we have this leper, this guy who, 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 who could not leave the colony, could not be among regular people. 
And I'm sure he had a little argument with himself, like we all do. Should I go or shouldn't I? Should I go or should I stay here? I know he can heal me, but should I go? He wasn't worried if Jesus could heal him or not. He was afraid of if he showed up, what was going to happen? What was going to happen if he showed up? What would people do? What would people say? He decided, I'm going. I'm going. Now, out of, every, out of everybody in that leper colony, he said, I'm going. I don't know how many people were there. It doesn't matter, but I knew, knew it was more than him. I'm sure he discussed it with the uh, other people there. You know, he heard about Jesus. Yeah, I heard about him. He, you know, he's a great healer. Yeah, I know. He's a young prophet out there healing any and everything, casting out devils, healing all the sick. Yeah, I heard. I'm going. I don't know. Well, you stay here. I'm going. So he decides to go and see Jesus. Define all custom. Define even the Mosaic law. See, it was against the Mosaic law for him to go there. So he defied even the Mosaic law. And that had to be hard. That had to be hard. And he did all that only to probably face an angry, hostile crowd. Because, let's be honest, you know, if you lived in those times and a leper came by you, what would you do? Either, that's right, run, or as many people would do, find a rock to hit him with. You know, they were very fond of stoning in those days. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, and, 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 and he, had to, he had to declare himself unclean. So he can just walk along. He had to say over and over again as he's walking among people, unclean, 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 so the people would know he was a leper. So he's shouting these words as he's walking, making his way into the city, through the city, to find Jesus. Mm. See, it takes a great deal of courage to come to Christ. How much courage did it take for that man to leave that leper colony ravaged with the sickness that was there? And let's hear again. What is, what is leprosy? A type of sin. It, it, it typifies sin. So to leave sin, come out of sin and come into a place of restoration. For most of us, if we're honest, it wasn't easy coming to Christ. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to get saved today. You didn't wake up that morning and say, I'm going to get saved. You, you didn't wake up and say, I'm going to be filled with the Holy Ghost today. No. So for some of us, probably for most of us, we probably fought with ourselves. Should I or shouldn't I? Yeah, I, I just heard somebody say, am I worthy? But others would probably say, I don't know about all this. Look what I might be giving up. Look what I'm going to give up. It takes a lot of courage to come to Jesus. And people who come, and I'm not talking about those who come on an emotional moment. I'm talking about those who really make a decision and come to Christ, who have been changed. Those are the most courageous people in the, in the world. Because, see, you're just not leaving behind a lifestyle. You're leaving behind everything you know. Like, remember we talked about Ruth? Ruth did what? She left, the, she left behind everything she knew. She told Naomi, she says, where you go, I go. See, those are the words we should, we should, we should be saying to Jesus. Jesus, where you go, I go. Where you live, I'm going to live. What you do, that's what I'm going to do. Your God, my God. See, those are the things we ought to be saying to, to Jesus Christ. As Ruth said to Naomi, she left everything behind, mother, father, family, everything. 
And it's the same thing with you and me. I'm not talking about those who want to keep on dabbling in the world. I'm talking about the real saints of God. You leave everything behind. I remember when I got saved, I, had, I left everything behind. I, left every, I didn't realize at the moment the commitment I had made, but I left everything behind. Everything. And there was some reminders that let me know that I left them behind. And, and it wasn't easy because they wanted to pull you back. What's that line in, in the Godfather 3? He said, every time I try and get out, they say, they pull me back in. Remember that line? It's the same thing. Isn't that, isn't that true in the world? Isn't that true of the devil? Every time, you, every time you try and get out, he wants to pull you back in. But it's the strong and courageous person that despite the fact that they're trying to pull you in, they keep moving forward. They keep walking toward Christ. No matter how many hands got your arm and your legs and your shoulders and trying to pull you back, you should shrug them off and keep walking forward. Keep walking forward. Keep Keep walking forward. Why? Because you have made a commitment. You have decided that you're going to follow Jesus. And understand me when I tell you this. Your decision to follow Jesus didn't come from you. It came from God the Father through the Holy Ghost in your life. He is the one that drew you, called you to come to him and to come to Jesus. He is the one that said, come on, it is time for you. God is calling your name. Your number has been pulled, if you, might, if you want to go say it that way. See, when you're desperate, there's no other recourse. You've got to come to Jesus to be cleansed. So here suddenly, after all the unclean, unclean, he decides to go and he, he faces every, all the people he's got to face. And the Bible doesn't say all that, but I know that that's what's happened. Here he is at the feet of Jesus. He falls at the feet of Jesus. The Bible says beseeching. He came to Jesus, beseeching him, begging, begging him. And what does he say? If you are willing... He didn't say, are you able? He didn't say, I hope you can do this. He said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. If you're willing, I can be clean today. It all depends on your willingness because I know you can do it. I believe you. But are you willing to touch somebody like me? sickness was healed see he had the faith he understood that Jesus healed sick people that those who had demons the demons were cast out and now a leper was about to be cleansed Jesus did something at that moment that caused people to gasp he reached out with his hand and he touched him. Number one, under the Mosaic law, you do not touch a leper. But here's the deal. You say, well, Jesus broke the law. No, he didn't. And not just because he's the one that made the law. No. He didn't break the law because by this man's faith, he was already being healed. He was already being cleansed. So Jesus did something that caused the people to say, oh, it's people around him to step back because he touched that man the first touch that man the first touch of human compassion that man had had since he had uh, a contracted leprosy nobody would touch a leper and now here's Jesus out of his compassion because the Bible says he was moved with compassion his heart went out to this man this man who was missing fingers and toes and all gnarled up in his face and, and, and his skin lesions and so forth and so on. And he reaches out because of his, his, his compassion for this, this broken human. This man who was made in the image and likeness of God. One of God's creations was marred and destroyed by sin and so Jesus reaches out his hand and he touches him and that man hadn't felt the warmth of a human touch since he contracted leprosy and Jesus looks at him 
and said, I will. I will. You know, I love, I love the Lord because his, his, when he dealt with people, it was very simple. He didn't use a lot of words. He didn't go through a lot of emotions. It was just very simple. I will. Be thou clean or cleansed. I am willing. Be cleansed. Wow. By the simple fact of his faith, and he came to Jesus. He didn't know it at that time, but his faith had already began working something inside of him. And as he lay at Jesus' feet, begging his faith, not, not oh, oh, I hope you can, but begging, if you will, is it your will to heal me? I know you can. See, I, we, we, always say, we always say this, I know God can do all things. But will he do this for me? Well, wait a minute, stop saying that. Say, I know God can do all things, and he's moving on my behalf right now. By my faith, things are happening for me right now. Something's happening even as I'm going to my prayer closet and bowing my knee to pray to God about this situation. My faith has already been enacted, and something is happening for me by the power of God in my life. So Jesus says, I'm more than willing to cleanse you. And just as he cleansed the leper, he cleanses us from our sin. He's more than willing. See, it's the devil, the adversary, the accuser of the brethren that comes at you on a regular basis reminding you of the sin you committed in your past. The Lord Jesus Christ isn't doing that because he's cleansed you. Now, have you noticed something here? Have you noticed I use the word, the Bible uses the word cleansed, not healed? See, he wasn't healed, he was cleansed. And being cleansed is like being made whole. And it includes more, listen, it includes more than just, okay, a certain thing happening for you. It is something that, that deals with your mind, your body, your soul. It, it, it deals with everything about you. I'm not only just, my, my lesions are gone. My hands, not only the lost fingers have reappeared. The lost toes have grown back. And look, wait a minute. This wasn't something that happened over a period of time. It was instantaneous. It was instantaneous and comprehensive. He didn't have to go do, do any penance. He didn't have to go on a pilgrimage. He didn't have to fast or have a long prayer. He didn't have to go through some rehab. It was just instant cleansing by the touch of Jesus just like you when you came to Jesus and called upon the name of the Lord the Bible says if you call upon the name of the Lord thou shalt be saved believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved when you called upon him out of your faith and your belief in him he cleansed you he didn't heal you he cleansed you of all unrighteousness all of your sin in other words he made you whole that's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creature or new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New things have come upon him. New things are in him. He is new. He's now you have been made whole. You're just not, oh yeah, I was a sinner and now I got a bit of salvation. No, you are a new creature, somebody else than what you used to be. You may look the same in the mirror, but you're a new person. You're different. You've been cleansed. And so the reason a leper is cleansed and not just healed is because it's a work that goes through not just the body, but through the whole person. And since leprosy is a type of sin, according to Scripture and according to the, uh, what the Old Testament tells us, a type of sin, then the leper had to be cleansed and we have to be cleansed from our sins. So now he has to go to the priest. Jesus gives him the command. Now look, don't tell anybody because Jesus wasn't ready for, you know, he didn't want, one of the things about the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't want people just running, following him because of some sensational miracles that he, did, he performed. He had a message to bring. The miracles authenticated the message. The message didn't authenticate the miracles. 
the miracles authenticated the message. And so he had a message to deliver. And that message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, hear the gospel, receive the gospel because the kingdom of God is at hand. That was the essence of the message. And the miracles were so the people could see that what he was saying was true because they could see it by the fact that people were being healed and delivered and devils were being cast out and lepers were being cleansed. So he tells them, he says, look, obey what Moses said, obey the law, go to the priest, because the priest was the only one who could, uh, by virtue of his pronouncement, declare you clean and fit to live back in society. So he was to go to the priest. Now, the Bible only tells us about three other people in the Old Testament who had leprosy. Moses, remember at the burning bush? And God told Moses, put your hand, he said, because, you know, he, he kind of had a little doubt about, the, you know, who's talking to him. The Lord said, put your hand in your robe. He put his hand in, he said, now withdraw it. And it was leprous. And he said, now put it back, pull it out, and it was clean. So it was just, a, it was a, a miracle to convince him and confirm to him who, who, that he was talking to the Lord God Almighty and what God wanted him to do. Anyway, so there was Moses. There was Miriam, Moses' sister. Remember, because she came against Moses, her and her brother came against Moses, and so she was stuck, struck with leprosy and had to be outside the camp. Remember, she had to be outside the camp and until God healed her. And so the camp didn't move. They stayed in one spot until that whole thing was done, and that was her punishment for going against her brother Moses. And the third person in the Old Testament was a, a man named Naaman. He was not a Jew. His name was Naaman. And he had heard about, or one of his servants had heard about, or in fact, a, a Hebrew girl slave in their, in, their were, in their country had told them about a man, Elisha, who healed people, a prophet. And so his servant said, why don't you just go and see him? He'll, he'll heal you of your leprosy. Now, he was a general in his army, but he was a leper. And so he went, bringing all kind of gifts and this and that and the other. And when he brought all those gifts, and <laughs> the funny thing about Elisha, he didn't even come out of, the, out of his tent. He didn't, even, he didn't even talk to the guy. He sent his servant out, Gehazi. He said, you go out and tell him, dip in the Jordan River seven times. He'll be all right. Just dip in the Jordan River seven times. He came out and says, my master says, dip in the Jordan River seven times, and you'll be healed. And the guy got all indignant. Hey, man, I'm, a, I'm, I'm somebody. You gonna send a servant out to talk to me? I'm somebody. Why didn't you come out? And his servant was like, look, just do what he says. <laughs> no, no, you want to get rid of your leprosy? Well, yeah, just do what he says. He said, man, man, look at that water. That's dirty. That Jordan River, that Jordan, uh, 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 river water is dirty. It's filthy as this. Ah, no, 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 no. I, we got better water at home. He said, that's not what he said. He said, dip in this water. So he convinced him, and he went and dipped in seven times. Seven times he came up, skin was perfect, smooth like baby skin, the Bible says. Just perfect, man, perfect. So now we see these three, but up until, the, and so the only person who'd ever went through the priestly examination for her leprosy was Miriam. For 1,500 years, nobody had went to the priest to be examined for leprosy until this leper. Imagine the priest when he came and said, I'm cleaning my leprosy, examine me, do your thing, and declare me free. They had never had to enact that examination before. They probably had to go back to the book to find out how to do it. But the thing he did that Jesus told him not to do, I'm going to take a minute to tell you this. Jesus said, don't tell anybody. And what's the first thing he did? He told everybody. He told everybody. And Jesus wasn't trying to hide what he was doing. He just knew that people would be coming to him for healing rather than the message. And he wanted the message to be the main thing. This just authenticates what I'm saying. It's not all about the miracle. But he went and told everybody, and Jesus got, it got to the point where Jesus could, he, had, he had to go outside the city now and began to give his message because the crowds got so big. 
Unlike today, see, Jesus said, don't tell anybody. He wasn't told. Now Jesus tells us today, go tell, and what do we do? We don't say a word. We don't say a word. We keep our mouth shut. But anyway, so he goes, and he, he's declared clean. So today, the same thing is happening. No, that, 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 in that sense, that same law, except our high priest is the same one who delivered us, who cleansed us, Jesus. So our high priest, Jesus, not only has cleansed us himself, but he's also declared us clean from our sin and its devastating effect. And he has set us free from the law of sin and death. That's what we should get from the cleansing of the leper. We have been made clean. Sin devastates. It destroys, it, it, it disfigures, and it kills. But through Jesus Christ, we have abundant life. Amen? Amen. 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 Hope you've been blessed today. We are grateful you chose to join us today for Pastor Dave's teaching. If you have questions during the week or are in need of prayer, please email us at office at kingdomfirstfw.com and be sure to join us for our next broadcast. During this time, please remember to be safe, be well, and be blessed.